Welcome to the Expansive CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chapman, founder of Expansive CEO and X Squared Wealth Planning. Buckle in as we explore how to create true prosperity and build a business and a life that expands beyond yourself and makes a dent in the universe. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Expansive CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chapman. And today my guest that's with me is Vince Covino, who is actually a very, very experienced CEO. We're going to get to hear lots of really uh, interesting stories through the podcast today. And currently now, just as of a couple of months ago, we're recording this in September of 2024. He's the CEO at Warrior Sage Academy. So Vince is actually, he's been a CEO several times over. Um, he's an advisor, author. He guides executives and icons, investors, leaders, all kinds of high performers to really uncover their unique market positions. And he has a really diverse background in founding and scaling several different businesses in a lot of different areas. So again, just such a super interesting story. And Vince, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. I can't wait to dig into the heart of what you're doing now and how you got there. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. You know, it's been fun to get to know you. I appreciate when someone says I'm an author, but I, I need to confess, if I'm an author because I've written a book, then yes. If I'm hey. an author because other people have read my book, Nobody that has a different last name than me has read my book, probably, maybe a handful of people. But I remember when I was writing it, a friend said, Vince, if nobody else reads this but you, it'll be a, a good exercise for you. You so, know, yes, I did write a book and I loved it. But but ironically, I, I go back. I wrote this book 10 years ago and I go back and I read it now and I think, OK, academically, I, I, I must have figured out some of it. But now I process it at a just a more experiential level, a, a more emotional, relational level. It has much more meaning to me now. I, I read the book now and I think, wow, I didn't know what I meant, what that really, really meant when I wrote that. I, I understood what it meant academically. And so that's that's kind of a foreshadowing of where this will probably go today, I, you know, because you and I have had talks about this, of, uh, you know, understanding things as much as I could without having the lived experience. But then... Once you've had the lived experience, uh, it's been it's been an amazing journey because in this, this last six months, especially as I've made a big transition from you know, CEO of one company to, to CEO of another company, uh, it's moved so much more from the mental arithmetic of, OK, how do I solve this problem? Here's a battle that I have to fight here and moved, shifted from very emotional big vision oh look at all the wonderful things that are coming about in this space and so radical shift in the last six months it's been exhilarating oh my gosh yes that that is such a perfect little anecdote with the book and i so i think you are absolutely an author if you wrote did the exercise of writing an entire book getting it published it exists in the world not not very many people have actually done that whole process so i say it counts um, but the, that piece that you're talking about the, like, oh, I love that going back. Like, oh, I, I knew that mentally, but I didn't, what I'm hearing is I didn't know that in an embodied experience. I didn't know that like in my heart, I just knew it in my mind and like connecting those, starting to understand how, just how important and impactful that experience is that lived embodied experience rather than living from your head. Let me give you a perfect example of this. This is fascinating. So two or three weeks before COVID hit, I had I was just about to sign a lease on a home office. So so Sequest, my other, in, my other business that I just uh, recently resigned from, we were looking for home office space. So we have several locations across the country. We're looking for a space in Boise, Idaho. Because we have about 45 people that just, they don't work at any of the zoos or aquariums. They just work at the home office with HR or call center or accounting or, or whatever, marketing team. There's 11 people on the marketing team. And I needed to kind of scramble to find a space because we were getting, you know, our, our lease was expiring in one location and this other one had fallen through. And so at like seven o'clock at night, someone said, hey, here's a space, space that's available. It was about 
I don't know, maybe 60 grand more per year than we were really budgeting for this, uh, for the, for this expense, because it's not even one of our locations that brings money in, uh, you know, no guests come to this location. And I went in and I looked, uh, looked around, I thought, boy, this feels really good. This is the office that would be mine. And I sat down in there and uh, just kind of spent five or 10 minutes feeling the room. And then after that, I did, eyes were closed. I was actually a prayer. I don't pray to anybody now, but at the time I was praying to, to somebody in particular. I looked around the room and up on the wall, it had the big whiteboard. The whole wall was a whiteboard, which I came to love, by the way. We had three offices that were big whiteboards. And at the top of the whiteboard, it said, seek first to understand. That's all it said. The whole whiteboard, that's all it said. Two nights before that, I, I opened my phone two nights before that I had just downloaded a new goal tracking app. And goal number three on that was, there was like five goals I think that I had was seek first to understand. And I just reread Covey's book for the, I don't know, probably second or third time in my life. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to take that as a sign and sign the lease. And that mentally became a very important piece for me to say, okay, I'm going to try harder to go into a, a meeting, a conversation, a negotiation with an intent to really understand. And I would have that right here. And I would go through the motions of seeking to understand, asking questions, exploring, but there was still a little bit of, and this, this word scares me, I hate to, to use it, but maybe a little bit of inauthenticity, maybe even a little bit of manipulation from this standpoint, not dishonesty, but a, a portrayal of certain things that weren't perfectly integrated mm -hmm. with exactly the reality of things. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm probably being a, my own worst critic here, but long story short, in the last six months, I went through a process that unlocked my heart. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't about, oh, okay, seek first to understand mentally, how do you do that? It was an altruistic curiosity, a, 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 a true deep at the core. I want to understand this person, their needs, what are they, what do they fear? What really keeps them up at night? And it wasn't so much, okay, let me do this so I can negotiate and help them and, and, and create this you know, culture over there that's going to help us to make more money and the shareholders are going to be happy. It was, I want this person to go home and feel like they contributed and feel like they were recognized for how they fit into the team. And I want to help to ensure that they are in their niche, that they're in their lane where they're doing the thing that really speaks to their, the intersection of their skills and their passion. And when that hit me here, it became a natural process. Hmm. So then there's the, the, the intellectual concept, seek first to understand. And then there is the empathetic, you know, critical listening and so forth, right? And then there's just that empathetic, true compassion, true care, true interest in somebody. And that flipped, and not that I hated people, <laughs> not that I wasn't friendly and kind and try, tried, but it became very, it, it became a state of flow to seek mm -hmm. to understand because it was from deep, deep within. That transformation in the last six months was the big flip for me. Oh my goodness. You're, you're speaking to, I think um, for me, that feels like the thing that is missing from most business. Yeah. And I, you know, I work a lot on in, I, I'm a financial advisor. I work in a very, you know, logical field. Um, the seek first, to the way that you just explained that the seek first to understand, even in like thinking about the sales process of something, right? The, like you said, like asking curious questions, trying to get at the root of what someone needs. You can do all of that. Just like you said, you can be nice about it. You can be friendly, but when you're still coming from the mind and the mind is still saying, okay, what's, where, where's the in, right? That's the manipulation that you're talking about, right? Like the, it's like, I, okay, where, where's my, how can I fit into this puzzle? Where's my in to like, get, get what I need versus seek first to understand from a heart level, seek first to understand this human at a human level 
-hmm. all of the rest of that just falls away. The mental gymnastics fall away and you just connect with someone heart to heart mm -hmm. to feel like to under literally understand them. And then if there's a solution to be had, it's like, oh, this feels like, right? This is, this is something, even in sales, this is something that matches what you need. And the seek for me, that's what that feels like too, is that like, I can offer something that's completely aligned. And if it's, there's, there's no attachment when there's not the mental figuring out that goes with it there. It also helps alleviate the attachment to the outcome of this person has to do the thing that I'm saying, because clearly I figured it out and it's right. When it's coming from a heart level, it's, you know, this is, this is how I can serve. If you, if you want, if you're open to this, this form of service that I can give to you, then that's a good fit. And if not, if that's okay too. And, and Hannah, I've seen financial advisors that are in the head. It is intellectualized. And then I've seen people that, to, to your credit, they have the heart connection. They're, they're very good with people. Those are the best financial planners in my experience because they have an altruistic care. So if, so if I'm being super transparent, if I go back to 2009 and I think about one of my clients that probably was one of the reasons that got me thinking, I don't want to be in this business anymore. Not because I, I, I felt I was good at it and I felt I was doing a good job for people. Oh, but, and uh, uh, side note, this, this Vince is talking about when he um, also was the leader of Legacy, Legacy Wealth. Is that what the Legacy name? Wealth, yeah. So mm -hmm. founded that company and, and grew it to about 165 million. And uh, now it's uh, in the billion dollar range, definitely a top you know, wealth management firm out there. So I remember this is going back to 2009. I had a client that uh, she had about a $10 million inheritance from her father. And she, she just recently got in the last six months, properties and, and stocks and, and different assets. And she was able to find a way to cut her brother out of the estate virtually entirely. And it didn't set well with me, but I really just dismissed it. And I made it more about how do I get this account and how do I put this account into, into places that, you know, are going to be the best investment wise. When, if I were to go back, if I were to go back current Vince and talk to, let's see, 35 year old Vince, 34 year old Vince, I could just have a five minute conversation with them and say, let me tell you how you could approach this conversation. Approach this from the heart. Help this person first and foremost understand their place in their relationships with their brother, with their family, with others, with their father, with the mother, and do some exploring around that. So, for example, let me let me go back. In fact, what one more step before that you talked about the pieces of the puzzle and, and realizing how I fit in. In my mind, the the shortage in leadership leadership actually is when someone doesn't have good clarity of who they are and how their unique gifts fit into the world, how it how it creates something for a higher purpose or a greater good, something beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, as I looked at any client that I met with, it was building my practice. What's what are the commissions on this going to be? Okay, if we put it in this this ten million dollars and we're collecting one point five percent, okay, that's well, that's one hundred and fifty grand per year. That let's let's make sure that we're we're doing all the steps that 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 happens. And that should never be the question. The question should be, what is the greatest good I can do with this person to create the greatest ripple in their sphere? Mm -hmm. And if, if it comes back to them enlarging their circle of compassion, their circle of influence in positive ways, that's what I would want that money to be used for if I'm going back to 34-year-old Vince. So if 34-year-old Vince and 50-year-old Vince had a discussion now, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be doing, I'd be, I'd be slapping him around a little bit and connecting to him. <laughs> and at the same time, so the the whole purpose of this conversation, I think, is right, like those were experiences that you need to have. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's the, I would often say that uh, I couldn't have learned these things at Harvard. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have picked up a book and learned. Now, maybe some people could, 
I read a lot of books. I used to brag. I used to love to brag that I would read a book a week. And I did that for, I don't know, at least two, two, two and a half years. And then I slowed down to maybe half that pace. Now, just about any book I read is a rereading of a book that I read two or three times before. And now when I read Man's Search for Meaning by Frankel or, again, Covey and any of the great, great books that I've read, I think to myself, someone's gone in and changed the words. This isn't what this said 10 years ago. There's no way Stephen Covey wrote this 10 years ago. How did I not see that? And so that gets me then to this point where I'm at now, which is I'm saying, okay, I need to have a bigger megaphone. Uh, when, when, when I was five years old, my family used to ask me if I needed a megaphone because I talked too loud. And they would, I went to speech therapy. They'd put the, the, the headphones on me and say, can you hear, raise your hand if you can hear a beep, okay? And so they would try to change it so that I wasn't speaking so loud. And they would tease me by saying, I need, need a megaphone. Well, now when I go back and read these books, including the book that I wrote, I look back and I think, okay, clearly it had this intellectual impact on me and it served me in business. I had a lot of success I've had in business. Somehow I never got to that level of depth that I believe is fully necessary to totally unleash somebody on an emotional level, on a, on a level where they harness the power, sounds cliche, but the power of love. Yeah in business, the power of love in leadership and what that can actually do. That that happens down here, not up here. And I just have been so deep into the head. I believe that there's lots of reasons for that, kind of my wiring, my upbringing. And, uh, but, but part of it were, were also um, just little, little I, I had a great childhood, but small traumas that created systems and beliefs in my head deep, deep down in the subconscious. I mean, they were buried deep down in there, just like when I'm driving a car, I'm not thinking about it, but that's how I'm driving. And I had a lot of that. And I was able to find somebody that uh, that helped me to get deep, deep down there and unlock that piece. And I just felt like that's what it felt like when I made that transition. So I thought, okay, give me a megaphone and I'll help the 34 year olds that don't hear it. And we'll give it to them so that they can't possibly misunderstand and not feel it. It's such a huge shift. It's such a huge shift. And I, so I want to... Um, so let's talk about your next business then, right? Because you sold Legacy Wealth to your brother in 2009? 10. 2010. Okay. So 2010, you sell Legacy Wealth. The next venture is that- So the next, year I, yeah, the next year, I took a, a year off and wrote a book. And I actually hired two people, kind of full-time, to help teach me the principles in the book. And we would sit in my living room. And I would just say, tell me about this and tell me about this. The whole point, it was honestly, here's really what it was. At that point in my life, I thought my sole mission ultimately, I believe that before I came here, I, I, I lived as a spirit child and I came here born into the Mormon church and that my mission really was to, to you know, promulgate and to, to, to teach that um, and have so much fondness. I, I had such a great childhood and such a great upbringing in, the, in this religious background gave me it was a scaffolding that taught me so much of great principles ultimately i um my shelf my faith shelf broke and that that was a radical change for me mm -hmm. perspectives definitely changed when when that happened it wasn't something i wanted it was my mom died 10 years ago and i would say this was maybe three or four times more intense emotionally when i when i lost my faith uh, it's not something you want. It's not something you seek out. I certainly didn't seek it out, uh, but it was a big transition for me. Mm -hmm. Well, so in 2010, though, that was the belief. And so I hired these two, two brilliant people, spent the better part of a year with them learning. And, and, and my, my directive to them was, I want to teach that gospel that I learned, but do it in a secular format so that it will resonate with people so that they'll get closer and closer to, to that gospel of truth. And so that was the approach. I took the year I wrote the book, loved it. Um, again, I've gone back and read the book now and thought, oh, wow, there's, there, there's some decent stuff in here. It's, you know, I don't, um, I don't think that uh, it ever would have a hope of becoming a bestseller because of my, my first book and I was kind of uh, learning. But I realized that academically it had great merit. I just didn't have, um, didn't have that deep emotional connection to it. And I, I understand a little bit now. So, so a year of that. And then 
I started, you know, I've got six kids. I started spending a lot of time visiting zoos and aquariums. Mm-hmm. And in that process, um, had the idea of scaling a, a zoo aquarium business where people could get very up close and personal with the animals, feed them, hold them, touch them, sloths, sharks, stingrays. You wouldn't hold a shark, but <laughs> you might touch it and, and feed them, it. Right. Uh, otters, toucans, you know, thousands and th- thousands of animals. And so I went and opened one and then opened 13 more uh, over the next uh, you know, 12 years or so, raised about $60 million and uh, had about 20 million visitors over the last, uh, oh, I, I guess, 11, 12 years now. So a lot of visitors and that has been that has been the ride for the last 10 years. Yeah. And so you asked me to ask you this. Tell me about your last day. That's last sometimes. day. So a good part of that business was battles, uh, kind of dirty, nasty, ugly battles with some some animal rights groups. And I, I regret the way that that's gone now that I look back in the past because it took so much energy and so many means, so many millions of dollars in that fight. Um, in fact, one of our locations in Fort Lauderdale, I had invested three million dollars into a location, and uh, PETA had sued, uh, brought action against the city of Fort Lauderdale for letting me come in there. Wow. And uh, long story short, we walked away. Walked away from my $3 million investment. I literally had water in tanks and exhibits. That's how close we were literally without maybe a month or two of opening. This is, by the way, right when COVID hit. Uh, when COVID hit, the government, you know, obviously forced us to shut down all of our locations. And you, know, you have you know, probably 30, 35,000 animals to feed and 550 employees. It, uh, it's pretty expensive to, to survive that. So, we, you know, we lost. That was another, I don't know, 10, $11 million loss at that point pretty heavy hit. The fights with animal rights just never subsided. They only intensified as we grew, as we scaled. You know, we had people that are that were clearly on the inside working for animal rights folks that were on our payroll. Mm. Uh, you might call it espionage. Yeah. So what happened on the day that I resigned, I'm, I'm really getting into the details here, but it's pretty juicy. I, we had appointed our CFO to be the new CEO. The board had uh, voted and, and uh, unanimous to have him once I decided to step down. Which, by the way, in April, I asked the board to take a vote and say, hey, look, maybe, maybe it's time for someone else to come in here. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty intense against the Cavinos in this space. Perhaps we should uh, uh, have someone else come in place. And they took a vote and said, no, you're still the CEO. And while that felt really good, there was a part of me that was hoping they would make it really easy for me and say, yeah, that you're right. Let's let's have someone change. Yeah. So my own volition, I had to say, my heart's not totally here. Do I love it? Yes. Do I love the work they do? Yes. But I had, went, to, went to war every day with a sword in my hand. And uh, learned a lot about human behavior since then that would that would cause me to do that differently. And I think that that's going to be a, another story for another podcast. But they called a the, the, the new CEO of Sequest called a meeting for the top 30 people in the company, the VPs, the general managers, the directors of, of different departments for me to announce that he was going to be the new CEO and for me to say goodbye and to just share a moment of um emotion and, and, and reflection of all the things that most of these people were people that have been with us for since day one they opened their locations uh they had, they had come up through the ranks and become leaders in the company over years and so it was a very tearful very um emotional time uh, meeting for me the meeting was set for 11 o'clock on a tuesday my new business partner uh invited his top oh 28 29 30 basically um, master coaches and leaders in his company to um, announce me as the new CEO of that company at 11 o'clock on the same day. <laughs> so I thought, oh my goodness. And I was up at, at, at uh, on vacation at a cabin with my children. And this turned out to be the best day of my life. Mm-hmm. I told the, the, C, the new CEO of Sequest, hey, would you please move the appointment to 1030? We can't, can't do 11 for both meetings. <laughs> So at 1030, I got on and I just poured my heart out to these wonderful people. Now, these are people that um, I'd been through battle with. We'd gone through COVID. We had gone through 
all the stresses of um, negative publicity, stories told that, that, that didn't have merit of, of all sorts of different challenges, some of which I brought upon myself just uh, despite my best efforts um, of, of not having a good idea of how to, how to navigate uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, we had bonded in those times and, uh, and we were very connected, um, had, had developed deep friendships. So say goodbye to them. And I had about maybe a minute left at 10.59. I get off that call. I look at my wife, and I'm wiping my tears away, just bawling. And I said, how do I, you know, how do I get on this call? Mm -hmm. How do I do this now? Um, we have the vision. We we're, we're basically the, the, the new company had uh, been around for 20 years, but it's always been a boutique company. Uh, you know, they've helped uh, maybe 20 or 30,000 people. But I looked at it and I said, hey, if Sequest can, can, can connect 20 million people over a decade, animals to humans, can I not connect 200 million humans to humans? Mm. That's a big, it's a tall order. You know, when I'm talking about McDonald's, I'm not talking about French fries and, and you know, that, that's a trillion served probably, but I'm talking about 200 million hearts that are feeling a depth and a, an intimacy and a richness in the relationships that they've never experienced. Yeah. And so that call was what made the, it the best day ever. Yes, it was sweet to say, um, all, all of the loving, had the loving exchanges that I had with my Sequest leaders uh, and, and to feel of their love and to impart my love to them. The highlight was looking forward and saying, look at what's possible now. Look at what we've set out to do, which is just to enlighten, unify, and mobilize leaders for a higher purpose. And that next hour, I mean, if there's, I used to believe that you have to die to go to heaven. When you spend an hour like I spent that day, I would say, no, no, that's heaven. That's what it feels like. And it was epic. So best day ever. Yeah. And then of course the rest of the day was spent on the lake and on the river with my kids. And it, so it's like, okay, if, I, if my life is ever on repeat, like it, with a GIF or whatever, put me on that day because it was just that again. And I continue to have days like that. I've probably had a dozen days that are kind of similar to that. And then all the other days in between have been, been just incredible. But uh, I mean, this morning, um, I was just on an incredible call with, uh, one of our uh, inner circle clients from Greece who has, you know, owns a, owns a chain of hotels from Greece to, from Athens to San Francisco and looking at the impact and where his heart is and what he wants to do now that he's accomplished immense success. The things that he wants to do within his family for his legacy, um, it's, it's connecting with me at a very deep level because it's not just about, okay, allocate here, let's diversify. Here's what the Harvard Endowment Fund looks like. And here's how we hit the efficient frontier and here are the coefficients that measure risk. And great. Standard deviation is exciting. It is right. for me. <laughs> it is. I love, good, I love a good Excel spreadsheet. I love a yeah. good probability map. Give it to me. <laughs> and, and by the way, Hannah, it is a good thing that people like you have that mastery. And I've heard from others in our other, uh, friend group that, um, you know, you you really have that expertise. That's needed. No doubt. That's needed for me. And I did it. I lived it for me now living in that space of, of, of heart connections, of, of leaning towards those purposes, those just the, the I, I heard David O. McKay once say, and, and I'll, I'll use his, um, quote to explain how I feel. He said, find a purpose so big that it challenges every capacity to be at your best. Mm -hmm. And so after I had, um, let me back up in, in, in March, I, I interviewed CEO coaches because I said, there's, there's hundreds of people that are depending on me for their livelihood, for their mortgages, yeah. for their kids' school clothes. And I am faced with some real challenges here. Uh, I don't have the clarity that I feel like I need. I don't have the confidence and, uh, I was probably three or four sessions in with this new mentor, CEO mentor, that uh, 
the reality is he unlocked me on my first, very first call, 45 minutes in, and the fears, the fears that I had, and this is critical, the fears that I had were dissolved. And that freed up all this processing power and all these energetic units for me to then look towards a creative solution to see possibilities instead of being paralyzed, like in this fight or flight of fear, which I had spent a lot of time, especially since COVID, just because we were fighting, right? We had to go out and borrow millions to stay alive in COVID because, you know, we're having to feed animals, pay vets, pay for medicine. Think about how much it costs to own one dog. Right. Well, now imagine 30,000 animals spread across a dozen states, um, spread across hundreds of, of employees. So, so all of those pressures and, and then obviously climbing our way out of that and then just um, ha having our, our animal rights fights at the, at the highest levels. So he helped me and then it was three or four calls in that my heart really said, and I hadn't maybe shared this publicly for a even another month after that, but my heart, my heart of hearts said to me, this is the space for you. Mm -hmm. This is what you were born to do. And so then I started to connect the dots and say, oh, that makes sense now. Yeah. So that's, that's been, the, that's been the journey and it's been, it's been nuts. It's been absolutely nuts. So what I want to hear is in that first call with that coach, because again, I want to, I want to remind everyone, uh, first of all, like building a wealth advisory firm to 165 million is, is no small feat, right? That that's a lot of work. It's a huge accomplishment. And you sold that and you're at Sequest for, you know, almost 10 years at that point or 13 years at that point. Right. Um, and you know, again, eight figure company, you you're literally the CEO of multiple eight figure companies throughout your life. And you're saying in March of this year, someone finally was able to reach that fear that was holding you back. That was keeping you up, up in the, up in your head. And so can you remember or describe what that, what that was for you? What was that piece? What was the, what was the story or the fear that was coming up? What a great question, Hannah. You're so good at this. So, so there were probably four or five main fears. When I opened my Folsom location, my wife and six kids and I pulled into Folsom line of hundreds of people ready to line up. And you always see that you spend 5 million bucks to open a place. You hope people are going to show up, right? right. Yeah. There were maybe 15 or 20 picketers, maybe a couple hundred yards from our entrance, right by the right where people were lining up. And one of those lines, uh, one of those picketers had a, a pretty big sign, three by four foot sign. And it had a full zoomed in picture of my wife's face holding a kinkajou with blood sprinkled that said the Cavinos have blood on their hands. And I thought, my kids are going to see this. Mm. And I looked and it took me about five seconds and I had a thought because we're stuck at a, stuck at a light in the picket right there. Surely they have no idea who's in this car. <laughs> and my, I, can, I know my kids see it. And I say, uh, it's a picture of their mom, right? Yeah. I say, hey, kids take a picture. You'll probably never get a chance to see something like this again. <laughs> um, it so happens that over that week, there was a whole city that burned down in California. Mm. And so we, the, the hotel we were at had other people who were, had lost their business. One of the guys owned a restaurant and it had burned to the ground and we're in the hot tub and I could just tell he was despondent. He's looking down like this and his kids are swimming in the pool with my kids. And uh, he just, I was just sitting there. I'm, I wasn't, I'm not normally one to engage with strangers. Well, I am now, but I wasn't then. I was just more, or just think to myself and didn't want to small talk with the person on the airplane. I just want to put my headphones on, do my work. Um, but he said, I, uh, my hotel, my, my, my uh, restaurant burned to the ground. Uh, those kids worked there. They were like 10 and 12. I go child labor laws, bro. <laughs> but I've broken them all anyway. I really don't give a shit. You break all the ones you want. I mean, it's your kids, man. I teach them to work. And uh, he said, this restaurant has been in our family for decades, and it's our identity. It's mm -hmm. their identity. The city's gone. I can't even go rebuild it. The city doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, and so I told Satyan, who I was coaching with this day, 
I worry about my kids. What if this company fails? Hmm. Now here it is doing $30 million a year and I'm worried about it failing. Sometimes, hmm. you know, as Mark Twain said, uh, I've suffered a thousand tragedies in my life, a few of which actually occurred. Yeah. So that was just me ruminating. Uh, and here this guy had lost it. And so that was a concern is what happens if this fails? How will the kids respond to that? I wasn't worried about going and finding a job or creating a new business. I have other, you know, about another eight or nine LLCs that I've gotten, you know, investment interest in kind of a venture capital type of approach. So it wasn't so much that, but it was what will the people from church think? What will my friends think? All my friends, so, so many of my friends are so successful. Uh, I, I have five or six friends that, um, you know, probably, probably out of zero to everything I've done and they've done it just at massive scales, you know, pri private jet guys. And uh, what, wonder what they will think. Well, will they kick me out of the good old boys club? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so all, all of these irrational fears, what will my investors say? Some of my investors are child, not childhood friends, but, but high school friends. What will, the, what will the real estate partners that invested tens of millions say if I default? And those fears started to stack up. And I shared them all very openly uh, with this with this man. And it was about 45 minutes later that he walked me through in my mind. And here was what di was different. He got to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I was able to just get to a place and manifest in my mind the, the, the succession of those fears and bringing those into existence. And then how would you process that? And that's a super short explanation that, that dilutes it quite a bit. And I don't know how else to not water it down. But it was in that process that I realized, oh, I can manage every one of those outcomes. Uh, one, of the, one of the concerns that I've always had had is, you know, there's probably 20 or 30 employees out of the thousands that I've had that I really mismanaged hmm. because it was a financial decision. Yeah. I, if I cut you, it's going to save me this 180 grand, or I'm going to be able to take this $8 million asset and move it here. But I know it really puts you in a terrible place. And I would just say, there's the decision. It's simple math. It's zeros and ones. And do, when the mind and the heart is connected, you begin to look and say, oh, there are opportunities for an omni win here. Yes, absolutely. You'll see it. You're blinded a bit by greed or by fear, but if you really connect and you really seek to understand, watch what unfolds. You'll find out. You'll, so I wish I could do all those over again, but I also recognize those were experiences that uh, have been great tuition for me. And how powerful all of that is in going forward with where you're at now, right? Even when you were saying, you know, like the charts and the scatter plots and the you know, endowments and all like the people that you're working with now, the fact that you have that background, that you had the, you've got the knowledge, you've got the brain power for it. But now that it's connected, it's like, it's like, instead of floating off up here, it's connected in to the heart, the, to the heart brain power that really matters. Yes. And, and it's so exponent, like exponentially more powerful than when the mind is on its own exponentially yeah beautiful awesome. well Ben, thank you so so much for this conversation i have loved every moment of it i wish we had another hour to just keep going um but i just i appreciate you so much and if anyone wants to know more about you they can go uh to warrior sage academy and the website and see what all what all you have going on there um, and of course, if anyone has any questions, if this spurred any thoughts, send them to us. Um, you know, you know where to get me. If you have any questions, we are happy to maybe record again, um, and answer some of those. So thank you, Vince, for being here. I really appreciate it. Hannah, thank you. You're, you're absolutely wonderful. Really appreciate you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and be sure to like, and subscribe. And again, if anything resonated with you from this episode, I would love to hear from you. 
email me at hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, at expansiveceo.com and tell me about it. And if you're ready for your greatest expansion, you can find ways to work with me at expansiveceo.com and at xsquaredwealthplanning.com. That's X, the numeral two, wealthplanning.com. So until next time, remember that there is enough, you are enough, and your birthright in this lifetime is to be expansive.